All right, everyone. Welcome to the Ultra High Net Worth Clients podcast. I'm your host, Chris Broadhead. We started this podcast as a way to create a central resource of the best financial advisor practice growing tips shared by the most outstanding advisors in the industry, of which our guest today is definitely one. These outstanding financial advisors agree to be on the show and provide a ton of value for free, all in the hopes that our audience might learn from their words. My father was a financial advisor, and financial advisors are the main clients we serve, so our marketing agency's mission is to help every financial advisor grow their business in an effort to help the world become more financially secure. Today, we have the rare pleasure of talking with an incredible financial advisor, David McClellan, hailing from Scotland, originally. (laughs) David, can you introduce far, yourself far <laughs> and tell us a little bit about you? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I uh, uh, I'm actually in Austin, Texas, uh, not nice. not Scotland, um, but uh, I have been a financial advisor uh, for nine years. Uh, that entire time with Forum Financial, which is a uh, good sized uh, RIA uh, working out of Chicago, uh, and I became a partner at the firm. Uh, about two years ago, uh, so uh, yeah, my my story is that of uh, career transition, uh, which I think is uh, uh, can be a tough road uh, for for people, but can also be very uh, rewarding. Um, and you know, happy to elaborate kind of where I came from and how that feeds into uh, my story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, we we're getting more folks on the program that did transition from from one career to another and it, and it seemed to work out quite nicely we had, we had one gentleman he was an airline pilot mm-hmm. and it, you know he just kept giving advice to all of his colleagues about what they should do with their 401k and and retirement benefits and then he's like I should just do this for a living so he he built his practice just off of all the people that he knew within the airline industry and he he named his company Avion which I think is like flight in Spanish yep. or flying in Spanish or something. Um, so yeah, tell us, tell us about, about your, your story. How, how did you go from, uh, where you were to, to financial advising? Yeah. So, you know, I, I guess my early career, uh, I had done technology work and then consulting, uh, got my MBA from the university of Chicago, did some strategy consulting for a short stint and uh, a couple of uh, startups, which I still have the scars from. Um, <laughs> but ended up uh, in they've he- healed healed beautifully, sir. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, I got to uh, take the shirt off, I guess, to show you the scar. I'm not going <laughs> to go there. Um, but uh, yeah, I started working um, in the financial services and what I call you know the wealth management technology industry um, in 2001 with Morningstar and uh, wow. spent um, first three years or so I was there uh, uh, doing institutional sales of advisor workstation uh, to brokerage firms. And uh, the last three or four years I was there, I was uh, kind of functioning as a entrepreneur in residence for their advisor division, really trying to find ways to grow Morningstar's business uh, with broker dealers and, and financial advisors and did a couple of projects there. but. Um, uh, I think the thing that was had the biggest impact on me was we had a lot of institutional clients uh, coming to uh, us and saying, you know, we've got all these baby boomers who are about to start retiring. And, you know, should we be doing like we're good at the accumulation business, but should we be doing something different uh, when it comes to decumulation? And so I started uh, traveling across the country and meeting with heads of financial planning uh, at different firms and, um, you know, uh, often with, uh, Morningstar, uh, PhDs, uh, researchers, and, uh, ultimately started thinking about, you know, how do we help advisors with this and, uh, ended up designing and building, um, a retirement income planning application for advisors, uh, that was part of, uh, the office edition of, uh, advisor workstation for a while. And so, um, really got a passion for the topic of retirement planning and retirement preparedness uh, because so few people uh, in America seem to be on track uh, for a comfortable and successful retirement. And um, then uh, ended up leaving Morningstar uh, for a startup in another startup in 2007, uh, which was probably the worst possible time uh, mm. to do uh, a technology startup. <laughs> 
um, and landed at Pershing and uh, worked in their Ionautics Allbridge uh, division, uh, which essentially had uh, technology solutions for broker dealers. And uh, during that time, I spent uh, the first three or so years there doing institutional sales again to broker dealers. And then uh, the last three or four years there, I was head of strategy for Aubridge and sat on the executive committees of Pershing and uh, uh, Pershing's money management business in, in Aubridge. Um, and so, you know, during that time at Morningstar and um, uh, Pershing, you know, I, I, almost every broker dealer in the country at one point or another was a client of mine. And so I had a very interesting perspective on how uh, different firms and how different advisors within firms uh, approach the business uh, very differently and, you know, form some opinions about uh, the right way to do that. Um, and I left Pershing in 2015 and I was 47 at the time. Uh, I had a half-written business plan that I had written when I was at Morningstar on how I would be a financial advisor. And so I dusted that off and said, um, you know, uh, I'm not getting any younger, uh, now or never. And uh, I interviewed with uh, probably, you know, more than 50 different firms uh, across the country. Uh, I had some uh, very definite hypotheses about the business model I wanted. And so I was testing that hypothesis by talking to different firms and kind of, um, you know, kicking the tires to see uh, how should I change my approach, uh, if, if at all. And um, that journey uh, led me to Forum Financial. And uh, I started um, with Forum as a solo practice advisor. Uh, I had no salary, no benefits, no clients, no assets. Uh, living in downtown Chicago uh, with a wife who didn't work and two kids in private school. Uh, so no pressure, was, no uh, pressure. Yeah, no, no pressure. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it felt like I was lighting money on fire uh, for several years, but, you know, I was definitely motivated um, and uh, very uh, steadily built uh, my practice and, um, and things got more comfortable financially, uh, you know, each, each and every year. And, uh, you know, today I, I still operate as a solo practice, um, and, uh, I have about 125 clients and somewhere between 135, 140 million in, in managed assets. Um, and then, you know, from a, a business model perspective, I think the thing that I would highlight there is, you know, I wanted to be very intentional about where I added my value and, um, you know, what to do and what not to do. And so, uh, the first part of that was I only wanted to work as a fiduciary, which led me down the path, uh, of, of working with an RIA. And then the second was I wanted to outsource all of the money management to a third party. Um, because my vision of working with clients is that I wanted to focus on retirement planning and uh, I wanted to work with uh, clients very broadly and deeply because, you know, in my view, uh, if you're going to act as a true fiduciary, uh, that's the way to do it um, because then you can give uh, the best possible advice. And if I was uh, defining my value as I have to build portfolios and somehow do a better job uh, of uh, performance and portfolio management than the institutional team at Goldman Sachs, that didn't seem like a very good uh, way to define my value. And uh, if I was doing that, I would spend all my days, uh, you know, sort of tied to my computer, um, you know, managing portfolios. And I wouldn't uh, have the bandwidth to work very broadly and deeply on the financial advice uh, aspect. So uh, I outsource all of that uh, to Forum Financial. Uh, we have uh, an investment committee that has some really smart people on it and a good trading team that does all the implementation and rebalancing and uh, asset location sort of tax optimization. And uh, we use dimensional fund advisors uh, very heavily. 
Uh, so that sort of underlies uh, the core philosophy that we have uh, in investing. But then that allows me to um, really uh, operate uh, you know, very broadly and deeply with clients. And that seems to be the thing that they really, really value the most. Uh, so that's that's the approach I've been taking. Mm -hmm. Wow. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I think you've, you must have definitely met Brian Castle because he's a UFC MBA. He's, he's a Chicago guy. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm certain your, your paths have crossed. Um, awesome. So, so many follow-up questions. Um, oh, and I, I have a, a side, uh, job as well. I oh, forgot sorry. to mention I've been uh consulting with a firm called Ivante since 2015 or 2016 um Ivante is a technology company that uses uh, artificial intelligence to predict medical expenses mm -hmm. and um you know that's a, a significant issue when it comes to retirement planning uh because it's it's one of the uh the largest expenses people have in retirement and yet, um, most advisors don't know about uh, kind of how to think about it or know much about Medicare or topics like Medicare means testing uh, and things like that. So uh, I've been essentially heading up that business um, in the wealth management space. Um, we largely uh, have API solutions that deliver our data to financial uh, planning software uh, companies. Um, and, uh, have kind of developed some niche, uh, expertise in that area, uh, especially around Medicare means testing. I, I published a paper on Medicare means testing, some of the history and the implications from a tax planning perspective of that, um, which then led me down the path of, uh, thinking about retirement tax bombs, uh, which I, I published, um, a very popular series of nine articles on Kiplinger um uh about retirement tax bombs and you know what they are what are the causes and what are some of the solutions so that's that's sort of an area of expertise that i've uh developed over the years as well mm -hmm. uh, that's got a real nice ring to it as well retirement tax bombs yeah well a lot of people are sitting on them and they just don't know it yeah that, that could be a whole blog or podcast or youtube channel in itself mm -hmm. um awesome so you, you mentioned focusing on where you could deliver the most value to your clients and, and the market as a, whole, as a whole. How did you figure out your biggest value that, that you could offer? It's a good question. I mean, I, I think I had a good sense of it um, from the start. Uh, but then, you know, as I started... Um, uh, you know, getting more and more experience with clients, uh, it seemed to really resonate, right? And and so I I continued to uh, lean into that, and um, you know, it certainly the approach has evolved and um, uh, you know gotten more sophisticated uh, over time. But um, you know, it, it a lot of it is very uh, basic um, type of of advice. Uh, you know, look at the balance sheet. There's all kinds of things to clean up on the balance sheet. Um, you know, you got too much cash, not enough cash. Your cash is earning 0.01% instead of 5%. Um, you're saving uh, everything you can in tax deferred accounts, which is going to create the retirement tax bomb. Um, you're not saving enough. Um, you know, how do you prioritize savings? What do you, what do you fund first, second, third, fourth, fifth? Um, and so, you know, a lot of that is, is, um, uh, in, in, in a sense, pretty basic, but even clients who, um, you know, are, are pretty sophisticated, um, you know, several of my clients have MBAs from Chicago booth, uh, uh but e even, even those who have that level of sophistication often don't know some of the esoteric rules around different retirement accounts, or just don't have the time and the patience for it. Uh, so even if they felt like they could do this themselves, uh, they see a lot of value in having a third party do it so they can focus on their careers and their family and uh, things like that. And, um, you know, just being being really proactive with people as well. Um, and one of the things that uh, 
I think surprised me when I started working with clients. I would survey new clients after I've been working with them for a while about, um, you know, how am I doing? You know, what would you change? Things like that. And one of the themes that consistently came out of that about why they liked working with me is that uh, I'm a nag. And uh, <laughs> they meant that in, you know, a, a very positive way. But the, the point was, uh, I'm so caught up in my day-to-day -day life, I don't have the time and you consistently follow up, right? So, okay, we did an annual review. Here are uh, 10 different action items uh, that I'm suggesting for the next year. And we've done one and two, uh, and now I'm circling back on number three, four, and five, right? Have you done this thing I asked you to do? Uh, and that's that's a huge source of value. And that's that's not rocket science. It's just, um, you know, persistence and, um, you know, staying on people to get them to do what they probably know that they should do, uh, but they just never make the time for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... Uh... Be, being a nag is in, in this room one of the most important areas to to be a nag. I I would argue. So yeah. I'm sure your your clients are are very appreciative of that. They're like, ah, oh, all right, yeah, no, fine, I'll do it. Yeah, and and I think you have to have a good uh, you know relationship foundation with a client. Mm -hmm. um, so you know they they rarely uh, think of it as me nagging. They're you know generally appreciative that I'm I'm following up and. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and that and that shows you you care about them. You're like, yeah, you're like, listen, you're paying me either way. I just want you to be safe and happy and yeah. Healthy. And yeah, that that <laughs> actually brings up, um, I think, the best part of being uh, an advisor to me is just having that impact on people's lives where they. It, it's so easy to see the impact that you're having, and people are are so appreciative of it. And you know, having been in the business to business world for most of my career, you know, there was always uh, the next consulting project or the next client uh, or, or, you know, technology, whatever it was. Um, sometimes it was hard to really see your impact at the end of the day. And um, then it was always, you know, let's just uh, rinse, wash and, and repeat uh, on the next thing. And so it just got very tiring mm -hmm. and, uh, harder to, to maintain motivation. And so, you know, working with, uh, families, um, to help them, uh, is just extremely rewarding. And I think my only regret is that, uh, I started doing this at age 47 instead of say age 30. Well, you know, it just, uh, took, took a little while to, to figure it out, but you, yeah. you got on the right track and, and, and I can see how, how that would be very, very fulfilling. You're, you're enacting plans or strategies and, and then seeing them, you know, execute and, and seeing the, the positive outcome. So that's not, there's, there's not enough jobs where, where we're afforded that, that benefit to actually see the, the fruits of our labors. So yeah, that's, yeah, it's a, that's a beautiful thing. So, um, you mentioned, you know, you, you figured out, you know, what, what your biggest values were and you realized that spending time in, in front of, uh, you know, your computer all day, maximizing the, uh, investment management and everything that was, was probably not the best use of your time. How, how did you, um, find and choose the, the third party investment manager that, that you thought was the best fit for you? Uh, it ended up being uh, a connection through uh, Chicago Booth. Uh, one of the uh, partners uh, was a, a Booth grad and knew uh, somebody who was in the um, FinTech uh, startup space in Chicago. And uh, so that was an area where uh, I also had some ties and so um, found them and and really just loved uh, the approach that Forum took, um, everything uh, about it. And um, yeah, I've been here for, for nine years now and and still love it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. So um, how you, 
you know, you obviously transitioned from, I mean, you're kind of in a, in a tangential or, or related industry. You didn't become, uh, you know, an engineer or something. Um, yeah. but at, how, how do you think your, your previous experience and, and previous career and contacts impacted your, uh, financial advisor career? Well, you know, like I mentioned before, just being really, um, focused on, on the business model and approach, um, and where I'm going to add value is a big part of it. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think it's, it's important from a, a credibility standpoint, um, and getting in front of, uh, clients. I mean, it, one of the things that's, I think, challenging for a lot of advisors uh, when they're they're trying to do business development is, um, you know, the messaging that they use uh, or, you know, the advertising for their firm, it, it's hard to tell from any other firm, right? It, it, it's all parroting the same thing. So from a client perspective, uh, many clients and prospects just kind of take the view of, I can't tell any of you guys apart. Right. So how do I make a choice about who to work with? Um, And so I think being able to tell uh, that story is a good way to open the door. Uh, And so, you know, being able to say, well, I spent 15 years kind of in the industry, have seen it from many different aspects. um, And, uh, you know, so I, I, I know a lot about this. I know a lot about different approaches that advisors have, um, you know, worked at Morningstar, which is, uh, you know, a name that a lot of, uh, people know and understand. Um, and so that sort of opens the door. Uh, it, it's still about relationships yeah. more than, than anything else. And, uh, I think that's an area where I do a good job and, and I'm, I'm pretty successful at developing, you know, authentic relationships with people. And uh, that's where a lot of advisors, I, I feel struggle a bit. You know, you, you may have an advisor that says, well, I wanted to become an advisor because I, I love investing and, you know, they're, they're very technical. Um, and then the sales and relationship, uh, development aspect of it is, is very foreign to them. Uh, and that's an area where, uh, many of them struggle. And, um, you know, that's the thing that, that most advisors in this industry that wash out essentially fail on the business development, uh, aspect of things. And, you know, you, you, it helps if you're coming from a very authentic place. Um, you know, you, you like your client, you genuinely want to help them, um, and you seek to understand them in a deep fundamental way. Uh, and that can be really important to developing the relationship. And, uh, I think a lot of people struggle with that. Um, and sometimes, you know, one part of my approach is, uh, just to, um, you know, share with people too, right? So, uh, you know, my own, um, challenges, uh, or, or struggles in different aspects of my life and my family. Um, you know, I, I find that, um, oftentimes we have many of the same struggles and challenges. And, and so I think too many advisors try to put up this perfection, uh, or perfect facade. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the professional, uh, there's going to be this, this wall, you know, I'm not going to open the kimono any about myself personally. And I think that's a mistake. I, I, mm-hmm. I actually would, would lean into that. You know, you're, you're learning a lot about your, your clients' personal lives. I feel like it's, it's only fair that, you know, you're sharing some of, of your life, right? So it, it, it helps, mm-hmm. I think, be on more equal footing uh, with the client than, than being in sort of a, a you know, client customer type of uh, transactional um, situation. So I would encourage advisors to don't be afraid to, to share things about yourself and, and your own struggles. Um, you know, nobody's perfect. Everybody has stuff in their lives, uh, that, um, uh, you know, is, is challenging and, and that's a really important part of the relationship building. 
And I, I would imagine that can help a client retention tremendously as well. It's, you know, you, you really develop and deepen that relationship. You're, you're being vulnerable, share, sharing, you know, things you've struggled with potentially. And, and that's, you know, really deepening that relationship and, and making it harder yeah. to, uh, to, to lose. Well, it, it makes me human, right? Um, yeah. you know, it, 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 it creates an opening for them to share, uh, stuff about their own lives that maybe they didn't think that they were going to share with their financial advisor. Right. So, um, it, it creates a more meaningful relationship between, uh, the client and, and the, uh, advisor. And, uh, I think that's really important, right? Um, it, it's, it, what, it's what creates, uh, trust, uh, certainly, um, you know, loyalty and, and, uh, you know, wanting to stick with you through thick and thin, you know, like some years, uh, market performance isn't very good, right? So, um, you know, that happens, that's a aspect of investing. Um, but I think when you have that really deep, um, meaningful relationship with someone, uh, it's, it's, they're more likely to stick through, uh, you know, the bad times, um, uh, with you and, and follow your advice and, and trust you. Yeah. A Amen. So, okay. So nine years ago you had, uh, $0 in asset center management. How, how did you find clients nine years ago? How did you, how, how do you find clients today? How, how did you build this, this beautiful practice that you, that you, um, so I, I started off, uh, like I, I spent the first six months, um, sort of preparing for this and yeah, I went through every contact that I used to have, um, at different jobs, you know, sifting through emails for 10 years, uh, LinkedIn, really developing a database of people who I knew, right. And uh, so started off um, really just reaching out to uh, to them um, and trying to get uh, to get meetings and um, and being persistent on that and um, that part of it uh, and you know my my background I had spent a lot of time in um, you know software sales to businesses and uh, you know I'm genuinely generally an introverted person who because I had sales jobs, learned how to be extroverted. Um, sometimes it's, uh, it's still challenging because it, it takes perhaps more energy from me, uh, to be that way. Um, but I, you know, sales could have was, fooled me, sir. <laughs> well, uh, I've, I've gotten pretty good at it. Um, but it, it's, you know, business development in many senses, I, I tell people it's, it's an activity game. Um, and so you just have to keep up with it and, um, you know, keep reaching out to people and, uh, eventually you will get those conversations and then, you know, you have an opportunity to develop the relationship, um, and demonstrate how you're adding value and, and things just go, uh, from there. So, you know, I have, um, I guess a couple of, uh, niches, but I wouldn't call my practice necessarily a a niche practice like your example of uh, the pilot which is a great one right um mm -hmm. I mean, that makes uh, a ton of sense because there's just a natural trust and connection that that person would have with potential clients um i was a uh swimmer at the university of texas uh in college and so i have a fair number of uh clients who are former texas swimmers um mm -hmm. You know that's that's a niche. I'm also a huge Texas Longhorn uh, fan, so I've actually been uh, sponsoring a podcast for about three years on um, uh, Texas uh, football. Uh, so um, have gotten uh, you know some leads uh, from that, but um, you know outside of that, haven't really used um, uh, many third party uh, marketing services. It's it's really all been organic. Wow. 
Uh, you're the first guest who has used a podcast to, to finally, to, has that been effective or worth the, the effort and money? Yeah. Yeah, it has. Um, you know, and, and I, I think it works partly because of the aligned affinity, right? I'm, I'm, uh, a Texas football junkie. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and the people that listen to an hour long, uh, weekly podcast on Texas football, um, are also. And so, um, there's, there's a natural affinity there, um, you know, where, uh, you know, starting a conversation, um, you know, we can talk about what do you think is going on with the linebackers? Um, and, uh, you know, it's just another way to uh, develop um, that uh, affinity in the relationship. And so, um, and st you know, just staying with it, you know, I, I think a lot of, a lot of this is, you know, it's that concept of drip marketing. Um, you know, someone doesn't, you know, just hear your name and then immediately say, oh, I'm going to call David up. Um, it may be that they've heard the name five or 10 times over the course of a year and then finally, it's like, yeah, I've been meaning to to do that. I just haven't uh, uh, done it. And you know what? I changed helpful jobs. Na helpful nagging. Helpful well. nagging. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just Full staying circle. in front of people, right? <laughs> um, and then, you know, when the time is right, uh, then uh, they will reach out to me. So, you know, I've gotten a lot of business um, from the podcast sponsorship. And, um, you know, I the Kiplinger uh, series on retirement tax bombs uh, has been um, a good source of, uh, of people you know, reaching out to me, um, because of that, uh, expertise that I have. Um, so it, it's been, you know, just a little bit of, of everything. Well, that, that's definitely one of the, the most fun marketing strategies I, I've heard so far. It, it really connects with what you love and, and you're leveraging what you love and, and know about, to uh, to connect with your ideal customer further. So nice, nice, nice work there. Yeah. I think anytime you can do like focus in on an area or, um, a group of people that you have a natural affinity for or love for, um, it just makes it fun. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. don't go, don't go, uh, fishing if you hate fishing. Right. <laughs> so, um, do the things that you like to do. Um, and, uh, take, you know, joy out of that. And then, uh, along the way, if you can uh, get clients, um, great. Yeah. A amen. Why, wise words there. So got, got a couple different directions here. Um, so, you know, when you're, you were just starting, you're going through all of your contacts, basically through your entire life. Is it a soft pitch? Is it a hard pitch? Is it a, Hey, like, hear me out. What, what, how do, how do you get them on the phone? Well, a lot of it was email based, um, rather than, than cold calling. Um, and I don't know that there's a right or wrong approach to this, but you know, it was like personalized emails, you know, sharing a little bit about my story, who I am, what I do, why I'm different. Um, you know, let me know if you want to set up an intro consult. Um, and so, um, you know, that type of, of approach I think is, is less in your face, right. Um, you know, and, and some people respond and some don't, or some respond on the fourth time they've heard from you. Um, but, uh, by, by doing that, it's not quite as invasive as, you know, I'm going to call you and, uh, try to talk about financial planning at some random time, uh, you know, as you're preparing dinner for your family. Right. Um, I just, that doesn't sit well with me. Yeah. Um, you know, so people will, will, uh, respond, um, when they're ready. Um, and you know, if you do enough of that and your messaging is good, um, about, you know, what you do and, you know, how you add value and why you're different, um, then I, I think that people, uh, will respond. Um, you know, it just may not be the first time you touch them. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure the, the business didn't build like, you know, consistently for nine years. What was there a moment in, in the nine where it just was like it took off? 
Um, I don't think so. It, it's been pretty consistent. Um, but I, I'd say, uh, at one point I had enough clients, um, where referrals became more and more important. Mm -hmm. And so I started getting, um, a lot more business from client referrals. Um, and then a lot of, uh, business essentially, um, from existing clients, right? So, um, you know, a, a client may start off, um, you know, with it, you're essentially managing a very small portion of their wealth. Um, but over time, uh, you earn more of that or, you know, there's job change and then there's, uh, a rollover and they're saving a lot because that's one of the key things that you're getting them to do anyway. And so that starts to act as, as an accelerator, uh, as well. Um, so like last, last year, for example, I think I was looking at some of the numbers and my asset inflows were, uh, about two thirds from existing clients and one third from, from new clients. And, uh, that was a little surprising to me that it was, uh, I mean, I knew it was significant, but I didn't, I didn't realize it was, um, that significant in terms of, you know, asset growth coming from existing clients and that's flows as, as opposed to, um, market growth, right. Um, so that's in independent of, of what the stock market's doing. Mm -hmm. So that's, you're saying two thirds of your AUM was from current clients just growing their, their assets. Growing. Well, that, that was the case, um, last year, uh, last year. in terms of, of new assets, uh, coming in in 2020, it. It, was, it was about two thirds of existing uh, clients. So you're, so you're doing a good job and that's, yeah, that's growing your AUM. Well, and, and that, that feeds back to, um, a couple of things, right? Uh, it's, it's the, it's the value add, right? You're just, you're consistently mm -hmm. developing value. Um, you're developing, uh, a good long-term trusted relationship. Um, you are, uh, really helping them to be motivated to save as much as they can so that they can have, uh, the type of retirement that they want. And, you know, all those things, um, really work well together. Uh, and over time, I think that's, that's been probably the main accelerant of, um, uh, asset growth. Uh, has been those things. Um, yeah, and that, I can't. I can't imagine a, a more satisfying way to in, increase one's AUM as well. Yeah. My, my uh, follow up question for that: How? What's the best way to motivate clients to save? And, and maybe strategies you share with them. That's a good question. Um, you know, I, part of what I I do with clients is you know, just retirement projections of, uh, you know, here's, um, how much in annual sustainable income and how well funded or unfunded your retirement is. If you retire by say age X and you save, uh, you know, Y dollars a year. Right. And, and so you can do a couple of different scenarios like that to compare and contrast. Right. So, um, you know, if you save, 50,000 a year and you want to retire at age 60, your retirement is going to be very poorly funded, but you have the capacity to save $100,000 based off, off of your cash flow. Um, and so by doing that, uh, you can paint a very different picture. And so uh, I think that's, that's one of the things is really just sort of, um, you know, showing in, in simple terms, you know, here's the long-term impact of, uh, trying to save more, right. And it, it's getting them on that path to financial freedom. Um, you know, that, that everybody, uh, wants to, you know, have that ability to just say, I'm out of here. Um, you know, I, if I'm, if I'm working, I'm, I'm doing it because I love the work and, um, uh, not because I need the money. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe a visual aid of like, okay, here's the house you could buy in Spain. If you save this much, here's <laughs> the, here's the villa on the Mediterranean. You'll be able to buy if you save yeah. even more. Yeah. So that, that's a big part of it. Um, and, 
you know, I, I think the other, the other thing that people often struggle with, um, even if, if they're good savers is this uh, fear that they're not saving enough or they can't retire yet. And, and you know, it, people, I think when it comes to that decision, it, it's, it's often a very, uh, irreversible decision. You know, if you are a high paying, uh, or high earner, uh, and you retire at 64, um, good luck getting a job at 66. Um, if you feel like you need to go back to work and, and earn, you know, anything close to what you were earning before. And so I think a lot of people fear the decision for, for a lot of reasons. Um, but oftentimes, uh, they really have achieved financial freedom. And that's actually one of the, uh, the most satisfying things to be able to, to share with a client is, you know, you, you, are, you have done that, right? So you can walk anytime you want. Um, it's just about, you know, are you really enjoying the job, right? I mean, certainly if you keep saving and working and, and defer drawing down your portfolio, you'll build up a bigger margin of safety uh, or be able to spend more in retirement. But you don't have to, and and that's very liberating uh, for for people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, it it looks like both of us escaped Chicago's winter. Um, <laughs> my my personal old story. Uh, twenty twenty hit. I quickly realized Chicago has nothing really outside of restaurants and bars and and shopping and when all that's closed all you have is kind of a smaller than average apartment and and <laughs> endless cold snow and gray <laughs> yep so i was like i gotta get out of here so i i moved to los angeles um for, for better or for worse i'm now in obviously in barcelona so you know make make what that with you will um yep. how how did you uh make it down to sunny sunny warm austin uh, well, I'm a University of Texas grad and, and former athlete, right? And my uh, my wife uh, is also a, a Texas grad, um, and uh, so we we had we had, we knew Austin um, the, from the late '80s. So it's a very different Austin uh, today. <laughs> it's changed than, a little, right? And <laughs> when when we were there, but you know, I uh, and you're I, you're an OG for Austin. Most most people, well, uh, not not quite OG, but uh, yeah, um, certainly uh, not the the newer wave of of uh, you, you know tech people. You um, you and Richard Linklater are, are buds. I uh, don't know him, but we probably wandered the streets around the same uh, time. So he, yeah. he did uh, days wrote and directed Days and Confused. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and Matt McConaughey uh used to be the bartender for the best man at my wedding. Oh so that's, wow. about, that's about as close as I got to Linklet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ra random connections. Nice. Nice. Did did you ever uh pitch pitch Maddie? Maddie boy? Um no, haven't <laughs> haven't come across uh Maddie, but uh he does uh represent the university in a uh very colorful way. Uh, so yeah. I love, I love his, his energy, his, his unofficial title is the minister of culture, uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, mm -hmm. for UT athletics. Yeah. That, that fits. That's an important role and he's yep. just the man for the job. I'm, I love that guy. I'm, I'm a big fan. Yeah. He's a big fan of everything. Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, how, how long have you been in Austin this, this, uh, this time? Uh, I came down here in 2017. Um, you nice. know, so been here about seven years, but, um, beat, beat I'm uh, actually yeah. in the process of trying to return to Chicago, believe it or not. Oh, okay. Um, you know, it's just, uh, interesting. We, we used to live essentially in the, just South of downtown, uh, in Chicago, an area called the South loop. And, um, you know, my kids grew up, uh, just in a very uh, urban area and we ended up, we're, we're, technically part of Austin, but we're really way out in the country. Um, and we way overcorrected. <laughs> so oh. <laughs> um, it's just very, it's very isolating where we are. Oh, I see. And, I uh, see. you know, we, yeah. we really love, um, parts of, of Chicago, as you noted, um, 
the restaurants are are amazing. Oh, there. Um, un- unbelievable. So, yeah. yeah, we're we're looking at um, at moving up there, but uh, you know my my practice is um, you know because one of the questions uh, I sometimes get is you know well how did you make your practice work when you moved from Chicago to to Austin? Um, and it's interesting because since COVID hit, uh, you know, we started getting heavily into Zoom and everything else. Um, I would say that 98% of my prospect and, and client meetings now are virtual. Um, wow. And clients actually like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I, I dressed up for you. I've got a, a button down shirt, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate you know, it. typically I'm in a t-shirt and, uh, uh, you know, working with clients that way. And, um, you know, I, I, that's my authentic self. I think clients appreciate that, you know, they, uh, I'm not trying to win them over with a fancy suit. Um, and, uh, you know, just relating to people and, and I've found that, uh, you know, the having virtual meetings and being able to screen share and things like that, it's, uh, it's more productive, uh, with, with clients and, um, you know, they, uh, they don't have to drive somewhere to, to meet with me. So it's, it's more efficient, uh, in terms of, um, of their time. Uh, so it, it works. And it, I think it's a fascinating, uh, topic, but, you know, I work with clients all across the country and, uh, almost completely virtual. That's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm also, uh, li- living that life. I'm, I'm in, Europe right now. Yeah. Well, a lot of advisors think that, well, I can't develop relationships, um, online and, and I don't think that's true. It, it, it's probably harder, but you can still do it. Yeah. I mean, most of my clients I've met in person, you know, a handful of times, but I talk to them, you know, once a week, twice a month, something and they've been with me for years, so yeah. it's, uh, I, I think, uh, you, you very much can build strong relationships through this, these digital, digital realms. Yeah. I think you just have to, to learn maybe how to do that. And, and maybe it's, it's a little different than how you approach things in, you know, the face-to-face world, uh, but it's mm-hmm. certainly possible. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, good, good luck, uh, getting back up there. Chicago is my, my favorite city in the world from May 1st to October 1st. <laughs> yeah. Well, so the thing, it, it's like the inverse in, in Austin, um, cause we don't really have a spring, you know, it, uh, right. it flips from, you know, being in the thirties or something in February to, you know, the next day you're getting temps in the nineties. And so. Oh. Um, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, April through October is, uh, just ungodly hot, uh, down here. And, um, yeah, it's, it's pick your poison. Do you, do you <laughs> need to cope with the heat or do you need to cope with the cold? And, um, uh, the wife certainly prefers, uh, the cold. Um, so, well, uh, that's happy a happy wife, that's a you know, happy wife, happy life. <laughs> definitely. And I, and I, uh, I, I feel your pain. I, I grew up in Tampa, Florida. So many, many summers, uh, you know, playing, playing inside. Yeah. Well, uh, Stewart, Florida is my, uh, hometown. So I was basically directly. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Nice. My, uh, my college girlfriend's family had a timeshare in Stewart. So I've, I've spent some, some time there. Yeah. Beautiful I've been back there. for a while, but yeah, it is a pretty area. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, we've gone way over, so I appreciate you, uh, spending, spending extra time with me. Um, one, uh, final question. It is mm-hmm. an open-ended question. You can take it in any direction that you like. The question is, what are you working towards? What am I working towards? That's a good question too. Um, you know, I, I think, the next chapter for me is going to be about decelerating my practice to to a degree. Um, yeah, I'm I'm mentoring other uh, younger advisors now, um, and uh, I think the nature of my client base is likely to um, evolve and, and change. And 
um, you know, this is a very common thing with, with advisors, but, you know, starting to uh, slow down a little bit over, you know, the next 10 years or so. Um, and, uh, you know, working with fewer clients. Um, and that's, that's sort of, uh, you know, a, the next stage of, um, of my practice and, and something that most advisors at some point have to try to figure out, um, uh, you know, how, what is their approach to that and, and how do they want to approach, uh, succession and, um, you know, striking perhaps a different work-life balance. Um, and, uh, you know, starting to uh, ease into retirement. Um, but, it, yeah, that's going to be a long process. Amen. Uh, and where can our audience find out more about you? Uh, look me up on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, you can also go to uh, forumfinancial.com. And I have an advisor page uh, there. And you can learn more about me in, in really uh, either place. Uh, or you can email me at D McClellan, that's D M C C L E L L A N at forumfinancial.com or give me a call at 312-933-8823. Still got that Chicago area code. Love it. Got to represent. <laughs> well, David, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me and my audience today. This was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it was a great conversation. I had a lot of fun. Uh, you know, happy to do uh, uh, additional uh, discussions uh, anytime. Awesome. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely uh, be be talking again soon. And to our audience out there, thank you so much for tuning in. Keep on growing out there, everybody. See ya. Hook 'em.